The last type of motion discussed among basic motions is helical motion. We talk about helical motion when a body moves on a helical shape path. That is, the trajectory of the traveling body is a helix. It is a spatial motion, and is not necessarily a uniform one. In nature or in everyday life we meet different types of helical motion, where the speed of the traveling body is either constant or changing along its path. Since the helix is not a closed space curve, the helical motion cannot be periodic. However, the projection of the motion on the plane perpendicular to the axis of the helix is a circle, along which the motion can be periodic. That is, the body can take the same time t to complete each revolution around the circle, where t is the period of the motion. Let us consider some examples for helical motion. The most famous example for such a type of motion is the motion of the electron or any charged particle in a homogeneous magnetic field. The particle propagates along a helical path, if its initial velocity is not parallel with the magnetic field lines. The trajectory of this motion can be recorded in a cloud chamber, where visible water droplets are induced to form around charged particles moving in the chamber, as seen in this photo. Here the speed of the particle is constant along the helix, and only the direction of its velocity changes. Another example from our everyday life is the sliding on the spiral water slide. In such water slides water is pumped to the top and let flow down freely on the inner surface, which reduces the friction of the slider spiraling down quickly. Since the slider has a gravitational acceleration, the speed of a person sliding down is increasing. As a result, the slider has not a helical motion in a strict sense. The path of the sliding has a spiral shape, where the diameter of the spiral is gradually increasing during the motion, as the accelerating slider is more and more pushed outward along the slide. We can also find examples for helical motion in industrial technologies. Spiral conveyors transfer loads from one level to another one. They are made of modular belt, that twisted around of a drum in the center. The belt is sliding on rails with low friction, which are fixed on external vertical support columns. If the diameter of the drum is constant along the axis of the conveyor, then the speed of the transferred load is constant as well. Such conveyors provide a quick and effective transfer of products, without interrupting the conveying process. As stated above, the projection of a helix on the plane perpendicular to its axis gives a circle. Therefore helical motion is the superposition of a linear motion parallel with the axis of the helix and a circular motion in the plane perpendicular to the axis. We can denote the velocity of the linear motion by VL, and the velocity along the circle in the plane perpendicular to the axis of the helix by VC. The velocity V of the body traveling on the helix is the vector sum of the velocity VL and VC, which determines the instantaneous direction and speed of the motion along its trajectory. Now we present the equations of motion of a body traveling on a helix at a constant speed with respect to a given frame of reference. We assume that the speed of the body is constant in the direction of the axis of the helix, and its angular velocity projected on the plane perpendicular to the axis is also constant. In this case the motion is uniform along the helical trajectory, that is the body is moving with a constant speed. Here a body approximated as a point mass is traveling on a helix, and its instantaneous position is denoted by the point P on the trajectory of the motion. We attach a Cartesian coordinate system to the frame of reference such that it is adapted to the helix. We chose the axis of the helix as the z-axis of the coordinate system, where the origin of the coordinate system is an arbitrary point on the axis of the helix. Then the projection of the helix on the xy plane perpendicular to the z-axis describes a circle with a radius r. The position p of the moving body can be described by the position vector r with the following coordinates. Its x-coordinate is equal to the radius r times the cosine of omega times the time t, and its y-coordinate is given by the radius r times the sine of omega times t. This is the parametric equation of the circle. The rotation angle phi is measured between the position of the body projected on the circle in the xy plane and the x-axis. The angular frequency omega is constant, and it is given by 2 pi divided by the period t of the circular motion. Then the angle phi can be written as the angular frequency omega times the time t. The vertical position of the body is determined by the linear uniform motion along the z-axis. It is given by the z-coordinate which is equal to the z-component vz of the velocity of the body times the time t. Since we have decomposed the motion of the body into linear and circular parts, we can write the position vector r as the vector sum of the vector r l describing the linear uniform motion, and the vector r c describing the circular motion. Here the x and y components of the vector r l vanish, and its c-component is equal to vz time t. The components of the vector r c are r times the cosine of omega times t, 
are times the sine of omega times t and zero. The velocity v is given by the derivative of the position vector, and it is the tangent to the helical path at the point p. Its x component is equal to minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t, and its y component is given by r times omega times the cosine of omega times t. These components give the tangent to the circle in the plane of projection of the helix at the point p. The z component of the velocity is just equal to vz, which is constant. Then we can also decompose the velocity v into the velocity vl of the linear uniform motion and the velocity vc of the circular motion. Here the components of vl are 0, 0 and vz. The components of vc are minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t, r times omega times the sine of omega times t and 0. The magnitude of the velocity is given by the square root of the sum of r squared times omega squared and the square of vz. The acceleration of the body is defined by the derivative of its velocity. Its x component is equal to minus r times omega squared times the cosine of omega times t. Its y component is given by minus r times omega squared times the sine of omega times t. Since the motion is uniform in the direction of the z-axis, the z component of the acceleration vanishes. The magnitude of the acceleration is equal to r times omega squared. The acceleration vector remains horizontal during the motion and always points towards the axis of the helix, as seen in the figure. Since helical motion is a spatial motion, we can demonstrate the application of the fernet serret frame for the kinematic description of the body traveling along a helix. We have seen that the position vector r is given by the following components. The x component is equal to r times the cosine of omega times t. The y component is given by r times the sine of omega times t and the z component is equal to vz times t. The derivative of the position vector r with respect to the time t is the velocity, which is the parametric derivative of the position vector describing the helix. Then the components of r dot are the following. The x component is equal to minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t, the y component is given by r times omega times the cosine of omega times t, and the z component is equal to vz. The length of the vector r dot is given by the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared. The unit tangent t to the trajectory of the point mass is just the normalized parametric derivative of the position vector, that is r dot divided by its length. Then the tangent t is equal to 1 over the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. Minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t, r times omega times the cosine of omega times t, and vz. Now we can differentiate the tangent with respect to time, which gives 1 over the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. Minus r times omega squared times the cosine of omega times t, minus r times omega squared times the sine of omega times t, and 0. We can factor out minus r times omega squared and write t dot as the ratio of minus r times omega squared to the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared times the vector with the components cosine omega t, sine omega t and 0. The length of t dot is just the magnitude of the cofactor of the vector, that is the ratio of minus r times omega squared to the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared. Since the normal end of the helix is given by t dot divided by the length of t dot, we obtain the vector with the components minus cosine omega t, minus sine omega t and 0. We already know that the derivative of a vector along a curve is perpendicular to the vector. Since the normal n is the normalized derivative of the tangent t, the vectors t and n are perpendicular to each other. That is, their scalar product with each other vanishes. However, their vector product does not vanish, and the binormal vector b is defined by the cross product of the tangent t and the normal n. Then the vector b is equal to the ratio of minus r times omega squared to the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. vz times sine omega t, minus vz times cosine omega t, and r times omega times the square of sine omega t plus r times omega times the square of the cosine omega t. Here the last component of the vector reduces to r times omega. Since the length of the cross product of the normalized vectors is equal to one if those vectors are perpendicular to each other, we see that the binormal b is also a unit length. Now we have derived the expressions of the vectors t, n and b of the moving frame for the helical motion. When we apply the fernet serret frame for the kinematic description of the body traveling on the helix, we can determine the curvature and the torsion of the trajectory of the moving body.
we saw that the moving frame consists of the tangent t, the normal n, and the binormal b at the instantaneous point p of the body traveling on the helix. We already determined the relationship between the derivatives of the tangent vector t with respect to the time t and the arc length s. We obtained that t dot is equal to the t prime times s dot, where the prime denotes the derivative with respect to the arc length. Since the derivative of the arc length s is equal to the length of the derivative of the position vector r, t dot is given by t prime times the length of t dot. Then the derivative of the tangent t with respect to the arc length is given by t dot divided by its length. If we substitute the expressions derived for t dot and the length of our dot into the right hand side, we obtain minus r times omega squared divided by r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the components cosine of omega t, sine of omega t, and zero. We also saw that the curvature kappa of any space curve is given by the length of the derivative of the tangent t with respect to the arc length. Since the length of the vector in the expression for t prime is unity, the curvature is equal to the cofactor in this expression, that is the ratio of times omega squared to r squared times omega squared plus vz squared. If we divide both the numerator and the denominator by omega squared, we obtain the r over r squared plus the square of vz divided by omega. Now we will introduce the pitch of the helix, which is the distance traveled parallel to the axis of the helix in one complete turn. The pitch is denoted by zp, and it is equal to the velocity component parallel to the axis, that is vz, times the period t of the revolution. Since the period t can be written as 2 pi divided by the angular velocity omega, zp is equal to vz times 2 pi over omega. Then we can express the ratio of vz to omega as the pitch zp divided by 2 pi. This value is the pitch per unit degree, and we denote it by p. If we substitute this result into the expression obtained for the curvature, we can write kappa as the ratio of r to r squared plus p squared. This shows that kappa depends only the radius r and the pitch p of the helix, that is the curvature is a purely geometric quantity characterizing the space curve, and it is independent of the kinematic properties of the body moving on it. The tangent t and the normal n span the plane of the osculating circle touching the helix at the point p, and the reciprocal of the curvature kappa gives the radius rc of this circle. The expression obtained for kappa shows that the radius rc is greater than the radius r for the helix, and its value is increasing with increasing pitch of the helix. We also see from this expression if the radius r of the helix is much greater than the pitch, then the curvature is inversely proportional to the radius r, that is the radius of the osculating circle approaches the radius of the helix. Inversely, if the radius of the helix is negligible to the pitch, that is we straighten the helix, it loses its curvature and kappa is approximately zero. The derivative of the binormal b with respect to the time is given by 1 over the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. vz times omega times the cosine of omega times t, vz times omega times the sine of omega times t, and 0. As in the case of the tangent t, the derivative of the binormal b with respect to the arc length can be written as the ratio of b dot to the length of r dot. Then b prime is equal to 1 over r squared times omega squared plus vz squared, times the vector with the following components. vz times omega times the cosine of omega times t, vz times omega times the sine of omega times t, and 0. This expression can be applied to compute the torsion tau of the space curve, which is given by minus the normal n times b prime. Then tau is equal to the ratio of vz times omega squared to the sum of r squared times omega squared and vz squared. By dividing both the numerator and the denominator by omega square, we obtain the ratio of vz divided by omega to the sum of r square and the square of vz divided by omega. We can substitute the pitch p in this expression, which gives p over r squared plus p squared. Then we see that the torsion tau of the helix also depends only on the radius r and the pitch p. If the radius r is much greater than the pitch p of the helix, the curve does not lift or twist up off the osculating plane much, and the torsion tau diminishes. If the radius is negligible to the pitch p, then the torsion tau is inversely proportional to the pitch p. Now we can summarize the equations of motion for helical motion, and determine the kinematic quantities of the body traveling on a helix in the moving frame. We already determined the Cartesian coordinates of the moving body in the coordinate system adapted to the helical trajectory. Its x-coordinate is equal to the radius r of the helix times the cosine of the angular frequency omega times the time t. Its y-coordinate is given by r times the sine of omega times t, and its c-coordinate is equal to the vertical velocity vz times the time t.
Due to the symmetry of the helix, we can also use cylindrical coordinates adapted to the space curve, where the axis of the helix is still the z-axis. Then the coordinates of the position vector are the following. The distance of the body from the z-axis is given by the row coordinate, which is equal to the radius r. Thus rho is a constant. The azimuthal angle phi of the position of the body is given by the omega times t, where the angular velocity is constant. The z-coordinate of the cylindrical coordinate system is the same as the one of the Cartesian coordinate system. We saw that the velocity of the body traveling on the helix has the following Cartesian coordinate components. Its x component is given by minus r times omega times the sine of omega times t. Its y component is equal to r times omega times the cosine of omega times t, and the z component of the velocity is constant. We can also give the components of the velocity in cylindrical coordinates. Its radial component vanishes, since there is no displacement in the radial direction during the helical motion. Its azimuthal component is equal to the radius r times the angular velocity omega. The z component of the velocity is simply vz. The components of the acceleration of the body in the Cartesian coordinate system are the following. Its x component is given by minus r times omega squared times the cosine of omega times t. Its y component is given by minus r times omega squared times the sine of omega times t, and its z component vanishes. The cylindrical components of the acceleration are the following. The radial component of the velocity is equal to minus r times omega squared, and both the azimuthal and the axial component of the acceleration vanish. These equations demonstrate that uniform helical motion is the composition of uniform linear motion and uniform circular motion. The first two component equations expressed in both type of coordinate systems are the equations of motion for uniform circular motion. The axial components of the kinematic quantities give the equations of motion for uniform linear motion. If we attach a Fernet Serret frame to the body moving on the helix, we can determine the kinematic quantities of the body in the moving frame, which has three parameters. The radius r of the helix, the angular frequency of the moving body, and the pitch p of the helix. We can express the frame vectors in the terms of these parameters. The tangent t is given by 1 over the square root of r squared plus p squared, times the vector with the following components. Minus r times the sine of omega times t, r times the cosine of omega times t and p. If we introduce the parameter beta as the ratio of r to p, which is the ratio of r times omega to vz, then r and p can be absorbed into one parameter. As a result, we have reduced the parameters describing the frame vectors to two independent quantities, omega and beta. Therefore the tangent t can be written as 1 over the square root of 1 plus beta squared times the vector with the following components. Minus beta times the sine of omega times t, beta times the cosine of omega times t, and 1. The normal n has the following components. Minus cosine omega times t, minus sine omega t, and 0. We see that n depends on only one parameter, the angular velocity omega. The binormal b is given by 1 over the square root of r squared plus p squared, times the vector with the following components. p times the sine of omega times t, minus p times the cosine of omega times t and r. If we apply the reduced parameters, we can write b as 1 over the square root of 1 plus beta squared times the vector with the following components. sine omega times t, minus cosine of omega times t and beta. For a given set of parameters we can determine the frame vectors at any instant of time, that is at any point on the helix. This helps us to describe the instantaneous velocity and acceleration of the body in this frame. When we presented the formalism of the fernet serret frame attached to a moving body, we determined the velocity of the body in this frame, which is equal to the speed v of the body, times the tangent t to the trajectory of the motion at the given point. Similarly, we demonstrated that the acceleration of the body can be written as the tangential component at of the acceleration times the tangent t, plus the ratio of the speed v squared to the curvature radius r c at of the trajectory in the given point times the normal n. This expression can also be written as v dot times the tangent t plus the square of speed v times the curvature kappa times the normal n. Since we already determined all the quantities in these equations, we can give the components of the velocity and the acceleration in the moving frame. The tangential component of the velocity is equal to the speed v, which is the length of the time derivative of the position vector. Then we have the square root of r squared times omega squared plus vz squared. The normal and binormal components of the velocity vanish. The components of the acceleration are the following. Its tangential component is the derivative of the speed with respect to the time. Since the speed is constant, the tangential component vanishes.
The normal component of the acceleration can be written as the ratio of v squared to rc or v squared times kappa. If we substitute the expression obtained for v and kappa into the right-hand side, we obtain the radius r times the square of the angular velocity omega. The binormal component of the acceleration is zero.